Great. We're very happy to have Denitsa Kosanovich. She'll be talking to us about a light bulb theorem for disks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really uh, honored to be speaking here. Um, and um, yeah, I want to, uh, so I, in the end, I decided to give a Beamer talk. Uh, I hope it will work out. Um, so um, just interrupt me at any point if, uh, I sh if I should clarify something and I might connect with my, my tablet in that case. Um, okay, so I will be talking about joint work with uh, Peter Teichner. Uh, that we recently posted. Um, so here is the uh, contents of the talk. First, I, um, I will talk about something that could also come at the end. And I think in our paper, it's, it's really the reverse order of, of this. Um, so this is why I chose to do it this way, um, just to clarify some of the points, uh, which might not be so clear uh, if you're reading the paper. Uh, and then I'll talk in the second part about those uh, main results, namely light bulb theorem for, for two disks in four manifolds. Um, and uh, yeah, time permitting, I'll discuss some more applications. Okay, so what is this main trick? Um, so, oh, here's a mistake. So uh, K and D, uh, K is less, uh, K is at most D and D is uh, uh, at least one. Um, so, um, M is a compact smooth D dimensional manifold. Uh, and I want to fix a pair of smoothly embedded spheres in its boundary. So here uh, I'm using this color coding so that you can see in this picture, I have uh, D is equal to three. So M is this handle body. And I have two circles in the boundary in this case. Uh, so S is the this, uh, orange one and the uh, G is the green one. Such that G has a trivial normal bundle uh, and they intersect in a single port. So this is sometimes called a, a dual pair. So they are, they're, it, it's a geometric uh, dual. Um, and then the space level Leibold theorem says that the space of uh, embeddings of a k-dimensional disk in M with the given boundary S, so the orange boundary, uh, is homotopy equivalent and there is an explicit pair of homotopy equivalences to a loop space on another embedding space. Namely, you embed k minus one dimensional disks uh, in a manifold which is obtained uh, from M by attaching a, a handle to G. Okay, so G is framed. You pick here actually any framing and attach a handle. Uh, and then you consider a space of k minus one dimensional disks with a certain boundary condition. So let me explain uh, in more detail. So here, um, k-dimensional disks are embedded with boundary equal to, to S. Um, okay, and these are neat embeddings and okay, they're smooth. Uh, neat mean they're, they're meet the boundary uh, transversely and only in, in S. Um, and then on the other uh, side, we have this space uh, of k minus one dimensional disks. So again, it's neat embeddings, uh, with a fixed boundary condition. So I need to tell you what boundary condition you consider. Uh, for this, uh, it's helpful to have this picture. So we started with the left-hand side. We have the, uh, we are actually trying to fill in the, you know, a disc, an orange disc, disc here. So that's the embedding space on the left. And on the right, we attach the handle. And once we attach the handle, we have this U plus, uh, which is the intersection of the of this previous circle with the handle, uh, and then you that U plus has this black. I don't know if you see it, but the boundary of U plus is is the new boundary condition U zero. Um, okay, so this I think will become more clear in the next slides. Uh, just this just to uh, yeah, just to get the indices and dimensions correct. So this U plus is an example of an element of E, capital E, is that correct? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. So U plus is an element in E. Uh, and when I take the loop space, I will actually be based at that element. Okay, okay. So it's a K minus one dimensional disk. Mm -hmm. And all the other K minus one dimensional disks should have the same boundary as U plus and be embedded in this new manifold with the handle attached. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm sweeping some things under the rug. So this epsilon, uh, which I have on the right here, 
um, I'm not gonna actually talk about it in this talk, but it's just some kind of a framing. It's just the choice of a push off that you have to choose uh, for, for all these uh, disks. Um, so it's some subtlety that we deal with in the paper, but uh, for the talk, it's not so important. Um, what's crucial to observe about this theorem is that the co-dimension increases by one. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, you know, k-dimensional disks in a d-dimensional manifold. And on the right, you have k minus one, again, in dimension d. So co-dimension increased by one, and that means that right-hand side should be easier to study. So um, let me give you another picture. So here's the theorem again. Uh, and what happens is that here on the left, I'm looking at spaces of, of uh, these orange disks. Uh, and my maps, the, the upper map is called the foliation map and the lower we call the like ambient for ambient isotopy theorem. Um, so what, what, the, uh, what, what is the space on the right? It's the space of loops like this. You start with U plus and this manifold with the handle attached. Then you, you, know, you have some path of these K minus one dimensional disks, which again ends with U plus. Okay, so uh, this is what theorem is telling you. Um, and a warning here is that <laughs> here I actually drew, drew something that looks knotted, but this is just a schematic, of course, because you're going through an isotopy, you're always going to be isotopic to U plus. But this is just like to, you know, uh, for your imagination to, to uh, imagine that in this space you can have uh, interesting families of isotopes, um, which would be harder to draw. Um, okay, so here are some special cases. Um, this uh, for equal, uh, k equal to d, this recovers the theorem of surf and actually his proof, that's very important. Uh, basically what we're doing is just observing that surf's proof works a bit more generally. It's really his proof and I'm gonna present it to you in the next slide. Uh, it's, uh, I think something that should be uh, really well known and uh, I think it's not, yeah, it just it wasn't used enough, uh, this observation, this trick of surf. Um, so he, he, what he used it to study diffeomorphisms uh, of the D-dimensional disk. And then if you think about this as like an exercise, you can just think a bit about why this situation is precisely a situation with a dual. Um, and then you get this delooping. So in particular, for example, for four disks, the mapping class group of a four ball uh, is the uh, fundamental group of the, of the space of three, three balls in the four ball. Okay, if K is one, uh, that's uh, something that's uh, probably also known to some people. Uh, you get that arcs uh, embedded in a d-dimensional manifold are homotopic equivalent to this. You just have loops on this d, d minus one dimensional sphere times loops in your manifold with the handle attached. So maybe this looks familiar because in the dimension two, uh, this is related to, to uh, point pushing. Um, namely isotopic classes of arcs in a surface M. And then for this to have a, a dual, you need to pick uh, an arc for, for, you know, for your boundary condition, you need to pick endpoints in distinct components of the uh, boundary of the surface. And then you get that uh, arcs, uh, isotopic classes of arcs with the, the, such a boundary condition are just in bijection with Z plus the fundamental group of this surface when you, add, when you add a disk to that boundary component. And this Z precisely corresponds somehow to Dan twists that you can do around that boundary component. If you put D equals three, then you get a classical three-dimensional level trick, namely that isotopic classes of arcs in a three manifold where you know, arc is attached to with one uh, uh, boundary point on a sphere, uh, then the isotopic classes of arcs are just uh, the fundamental group when you add the three ball. Okay, um, so it, in this talk, we are actually gonna use the k equals two case in, in which you reduce disks to, to arcs and in particular to dimension four, uh, where we, uh, you know, disks in a four manifold uh, are gonna, which have a dual to their boundary are become, become uh, the fundamental group of the space of arcs in the four manifold. Okay, so I'll talk a bit more about that. 
one case that appears uh, also in the work of uh, Badning and Bai uh, is if you, for example, if you if you're embedding a three ball in the S1 cross D3. Uh, yeah, that's all of the examples. Maybe I should pause a bit. Um, and then I want to tell you about a bit about the proof. It's really going to be a picture proof. Are there any questions before that? Okay. So here's a picture proof. Uh, and I think uh, then it, it will really become clear what the theorem is saying. Uh, so on the left, we have this original setup. We're studying k-dimensional disks with this orange boundary circle, S. Then we attach a handle. And now in this uh, um, you know, manifold, when, when you attach the handle to G, as I said, you know, you can assume that the G is framed, that that's part of the data, but actually it's not, the framing is not important. Um, when you add a handle, your green disk, your orange disk becomes something like this. Here on the right, you can see that it's what's uh, called a, a, a half disk. It really has one half of its boundary embedded still in the boundary of the manifold and one part of the boundary embedded in, in the interior of, of your new manifold which I'm going to call X now. Right, so boundary of G, J is what I, uh, I'll call U minus, that's the remaining or, uh, orange part, and U plus, which is this blue arc. I mean, blue K minus one dimensional disk, okay? And then you observe that you can re also go backwards here. You can just, if you started with, a, with some uh, space of half disks, that's I'm going to uh, denote it, uh, you know, half disks uh, in X. So this is our notation for half disks. Uh, I mean, topologically, it's just a k-dimensional disk, but it has this very specific uh, condition on the boundary. So if you start with such a half disk where your this delta means that uh, it's fixed on the boundary, namely the boundary condition is u minus union u plus, but just you know have in mind that u plus is now in the interior, but it's fixed. And also this epsilon means it's, it's fixed also on a collar of the boundary, but let's not discuss that. Um, then uh, you can go backwards. You can just drill out a neighborhood of that arc U plus, right? Uh, because you know all your disks uh, are embedded with, uh, you know, they have that piece in their boundary. So you just drill out a neighborhood, which is like a removing the handle that we just added. And then we got to get to the left left hand picture. In other words, the space of disks of k disks in your manifolds is the same as the space of half disks, k dimensional half disks in X. Is is that um, clear? Maybe this notation for half disks. Um, so you just remember that topologically it's still a k dimensional disk, but you know it has some kind of a corner. Uh, it's embedded, so it actually has a corner at that uh, K minus two dimensional sphere. Okay, so now what you do is you study half disks. Uh, and this space um, uh, was also, you know, studied by uh, Cerf, who proved that the, um, uh, you know, that the family ambient isotopy theorem holds, which boils down, which can be re reformulated as saying that this map, uh, map is a vibration. Namely here, I want to fix uh, just uh, I mean, the, the map, the, uh, it can be reformulated as saying that uh, any restriction map where you have embeddings of something and then you restrict to embeddings of a sub, sub manifold, that that's a vibration. And we're going to use it in a particular case where you study embeddings of, ha of half disks, which are just fixed on the U minus part. So just imagine that this blue now moves wherever in the manifold. Okay. And in that space, I can restrict to that blue uh, part. And I get embeddings of k minus uh, one dimensional disks, which are now neat and and everything. Uh, and okay, so the, the, these epsilons now again mean some kind of additional push off data, but it's not important. So for the argument, um, the important thing is that you uh, that this map is a vibration. Okay, that means when you take its fiber, uh, and the fiber is by definition the space of half disks which do have a fixed blue guy on the boundary. So it, they, they are fixed both on U minus and on U plus. 
Okay, so th this is what, what, what I denoted here. That was uh, our space. Then that's a fiber, okay? But then you, you use this very uh, convenient observation that this space is contractible. Namely, what is the space of all disks where you are free to move your other, you know, U plus part of the boundary when, you know, U plus is not fixed. Just imagine that I start moving this blue now wherever I want. Well, I can just start isotoping it into, it, into the color of the U minus, okay? So um, the total space is contractible. That's what I just said. So you get that, you know, it, for a vibration sequence, you have a long exact sequence in homotopy groups. So the connecting map uh, is a homotopy equivalence because the total space is contractible. I mean, it's actually, you know, a weak equivalence, but you can, you can prove the stronger thing that the, actually it's a homotopy equivalence and you can really see what the maps are. Namely the map, you know, I'm just taking the fiber now, which should be here on the left. That's this loop space at my base point, namely U plus. And I go to the fiber, and the map M uh, is really the uh, you know the, the connecting map you can identify using the family isotopy theorem. Namely, you take a loop of these blue arcs. Okay, they're fixed, and you just lo look at the loop of such embeddings fixed on the boundary. Then you can extend that to an ambient isotopy if you want. And that ambient isotopy, you know, ends with a diffeomorphism, which takes an or this orange disk to another orange disk with the same boundary condition, and that's the uh, the map from the loop space to embeddings of half disks. Uh, and the map other way is a foliation map. If you can have a k-dimensional half disk, you can just imagine that you're you're uh, starting with u plus and you're swinging you know, your, your arc uh, across your disk until you get to this U minus. And from there you have to use uh, your base point. That's something also I didn't discuss, but then you, you use your, your base point uh, disk U, uh, which is this one, which is in the picture, you know, like somehow you think of it as the this, this simplest disk. Um, that's your base point in the space of all half disks. Anyway, you, 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 you can foliate then the sphere which you obtain by gluing the K and minus U. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. We proved that disks in M are the same as half disks in X, and half disks in X are the same as loops of lower dimensional disks in X. Do you agree? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so. Um, how we're going to use this? We're going to use this for uh, uh, proving the Leibold theorem for uh, two disks in four manifolds, and also recovering the the case of spheres that was previously proven by by uh, Dave Gabay and also uh, by uh, Rob Schneiderman and Peter Teichner, who who generalized it to all four manifolds. So let me first talk about disks. Uh, so if M is a now an oriented smooth four manifold compact, um, uh, we now want to, to get the, our situation of the theorem, we fix a knot in its boundary. So now you, you know, boundary is a three manifold and I'm fixing a circle uh, and a sphere. So a knot and its dual sphere. And this happens rarely in, in, in three manifolds. Usually you don't have such, such duals. Uh, I mean, you rarely have uh, embedded spheres, but nevertheless, uh, we're going to see it's going to be useful. So um, S and G intersect transversely and positively in a single point. Let me fix some notation. Uh, we, yeah, this is maybe not so important, but anyway, the, the fundamental group or our four manifold is uh, uh, P and ZP is going to be the group ring. Uh, and if I remove from P the trivial group element, I, I have the subgroup of, you know, linear combinations where I don't have the element one. I fix the involution uh, on the on this uh, group ring, um, namely, you know, you just extend the usual involution where G goes to G inverse. And then finally, the notation, you know, ZP minus one sigma means the subgroup of invariants. So those uh, elements are which are equal to their um, bar. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, lambda is um, equivariant uh, intersection form of M. Okay, so in general, we have non trivial fundamental groups, so we want to consider the, the equivariant intersection form. Okay, so what we want to study is a set of isotopy classes of two dimensional disks, so just, you know, pi zero or of the space. So in the first part, I talked about how you prove that two spaces are homotopy equivalent. Uh, and somehow in, in this setting, we just really want to compute pi zero, the space, the set of uh, isotopic classes of disks. Um, okay. So that's the setting. And yeah, so the space level theorem that we saw uh, implies that this set of isotopic classes is pi one of the space of arcs. Okay. Do you mean a pi zero on the, in there? Yeah, sorry, I, I'm using this notation that the square oh, brackets are sorry, by zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I got yeah. it. I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So, so square, square brackets are always going to be pi zero of the space without the square brackets. No, I just spaced out for the wrong 10 seconds. No, no, no. thanks for asking. Okay, so now uh, the, our goal is just to compute this group. So we want to compute the fundamental group of the space of arcs in a four manifold. Now note that here we are just att attaching a three handle to a uh, framed uh, dual G. Okay, so it's just like a you know four dimensional three handle. Um, so before I go on, I uh, I'm, somehow I had to choose what I'm going to present, and I'm actually not going to talk about how we compute this group because this is somehow a topic really on its own, uh, and I couldn't fit it here. So I'm just going to mention some bits of that computation. Uh, but this is something uh, you should just think of this as you're trying to compute a you know a embedding space in core dimension three, and that's easier than core dimension two, right? So we're just studying arcs in a four manifold, uh, and one can compute its pi one by some classical work of Dex, as was observed by Gabay. Um, there was an invariant that comes from work of Dex called the Dex invariant, um, and it can be used to to really compute this pi one. Uh, what one does is compares the pi one of embeddings of arcs to pi one of immersions of arcs. Um, and then, you know, immersions are easy and then one computes the kernel. Uh, and this can also be done uh, if it somehow fits into this fr framework of embedding calculus, if you heard about that, because the work of DEX is somehow the second stage of that embedding calculus tower. And you just need to go to the second stage in this case. And um, that recovers somehow the work of, of Hefliger and Dex. But you can ask me later about this. But the outcome of, of that computation is that uh, you, you can get this um, such an exact sequence of sets. Uh, so here, as I said, like the square brackets mean isotopic classes. So here I'm fixing the same boundary condition for my disks, but I'm just looking now at ma maps. Uh, and this, sorry, I mean, here it's going to be pi zero will mean homotopy classes, right? Um, and then there is this map J, which is just induced by the inclusion. And the theorem says that, uh, you know, you can compute somehow the kernel and co-kernel in a way, but this is a, a sequence of sets. So let me explain uh, what this means. So here mu two is the, um, the Vols self-intersection self invariant, which you probably, you know, encountered, and you know, you're always using the lambdas and mu's in four-dimensional topology, and this is exactly the same. Um, I mean, same. It's it's just now on on homotopy classes of disks, which are fixed on the boundary. You can still kind of do the same count of uh, self uh, self intersections with group elements, and you don't count the group element one, and you mod out by r minus bar of R because uh, that's the indeterminacy when you're counting the self-intersections. So the, that, that map is surjective. That's somehow also kind of standard. When you have a dual, you, you can kind of get rid of, um, so, sorry, you can uh, realize all of these. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't need the dual for that. That's what I, the next thing I want to say is that if you if your mu two is zero, then you can realize your uh, your um, your homotopy class. Let's say you take you took uh, map f, 
which has boundary S, then it's homotopic to an embedding uh, if and only if this is zero. Okay, so and that's for where you can use dual. That's kind of also not hard to see. Uh, what is interesting is that you can describe all the disks in the homotopy classes of a given disk K. Let's say you, you pick the K, uh, which is embedding, and then you, you study all of its, uh, you know, all of the embedded disks that are in its homotopy class. Well, they're obtained uh, by this action, which we call plus FM and then G, this upper index G that's uh, our dual. So this completely describes all the disks in the homotopy class of K. Um, so, okay, so sorry, that's what I just said. And this action is obtained by doing finger moves and then Norman tricks. So you probably heard of all of these. Uh, and I'm gonna show a picture next slide. But somehow this is not surprising, but somehow the, the important part is showing that that's uh, everything. Um, and that it's, they're all different you know, that, that this map is uh, injective. So that's the next uh, thing that um, is uh, measured somehow by this uh, DAX. That's what I said, that the, uh, this um, uh, invariant of DAX uh, can compute for you uh, uh, this set. So the J, J inverse of K is, uh, again, it's the set of uh, disks which are, um, not isotopic to K, but are homotopic to K. And then this uh, invariant is a complete invariant of that set. In other words, it's the inverse of that action, okay? So I have an action of this uh, group on this set uh, and I can uh, somehow invert it. Uh, when I fix a class K, I can compute uh, the DAX invariant relative to K. Um, and this, uh, let me just mention where this, the DAX invariant comes from. Um, uh, it's uh, very similar to uh, the work of, uh, you know, the, in the work of uh, Schneiderman and Teichner, uh, they use a mu3 invariant, which comes from, you know, tr trying to, uh, instead of here, we just have mu2, you go one dimension higher and you again try to count some uh, double point loops with group elements. Uh, but the DAX count is better uh, because uh, it's you know it's a clever count um, which uh, uh, which doesn't have that uh, kind of indeterminacy uh, um, as before, but you have another indeterminacy, which is kind of smaller. I'm gonna uh, I think mention that later. Okay, so there's a lot of information here. Um, I'm gonna so here is the same statement. Uh, just I, I just wanted to add a, a picture. So, um, okay, so here is the, the schematic picture of, uh, you know, two-dimensional, sorry that it's in green now, I guess it should be orange uh, and uh, G should be green. Sorry about that, but I took this picture from the, from the paper. Uh, so on a disk K, we want to uh, uh, perform a certain action for every group element G. So what we're gonna do is do a finger move uh, into itself. So K uh, it has this finger uh, that crashes through uh, K at two points, right? Uh, and we did it around the group element. So somehow the arc that's, uh, that we follow is uh, G. Uh, and then because now this is immersed and we want an embedded disk, what we're gonna do to, uh, to obtain that uh, desired disk uh, is we're gonna tube uh, away those two intersection points uh, using uh, you know, under a Norman trick. Um, and we do that so that you know, we have these two uh, double points and we're gonna perform like fundamentally different Norman tricks to them. Otherwise we would get something that's uh, again isotopic to K. Okay, so uh, what I mean well, here you have a one sheet is, you know, you can think of one sheet as the one that's on the finger and the other sheet is horizontal. And for one of the double points, I'm gonna uh, use the sheet that's vertical to tube into G. And for the other double point, I'm gonna use the, the horizontal sheet and make, you see that this dark blue tube uh, is I'm, I'm, I'm using the horizontal sheet uh, to tube into G. And then I have to pick, you know, carefully the arcs, uh, but you can do this, okay? 
So the disk, what you get is again, it's now embedded and it's precisely corresponds to the element G that was here, okay? Um, so as you say, something similar uh, appears in the work of Gabay. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he, he really uh, managed to, to uh, extract this invariant of Dax from Dax paper. Uh, so somehow the, the missing piece in that story was proving that that's uh, um, injective. I mean, that, the, the, that this is everything that in the kernel of J. Um, okay. Um, another thing that I want to say is that you could come up with this construction, you know, just thinking about what it should be. But what I find amazing is that you could actually get this construction by performing that ambient isotopy theorem that I said. Namely, you know, the work of Dex tells you which loops of arcs are the generators. And then if you apply the ambient isotopy theorem to them, you get disks. And then it turns out that you get exactly, you know, to a generator G, you get exactly this disk. Uh, but that picture is much more complicated. That, that was like in our first version of the paper, we were trying to go that way. And then we figure out that disks that we, we should get are these. Um, it's just a bit, a bit more complicated to explain. Uh, but somehow, yeah, it's, it's very nicely fits, fits together. That kind of, that map that's connecting map. So it's somehow homotopy theoretic and this very geometric construction. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I don't have many more slides, so you can, you can interrupt. Maybe I'm going too fast. Okay. Um, so let me say about um, something about spheres. Uh, namely, maybe you were wondering, okay, this, like, they just look very different. How do you get something uh, for spheres with a common dual, right? That was the, the setting that previously was studied. You take a four manifold N, it can be closed or not, but you, you take a framed embedded sphere inside. And then what you're actually studying is the space of isotopic, the set of isotopy classes of spheres in N, uh, which are dual to this given sphere G. Okay, so uh, I fixed one G, which, which is gonna be dual for all my uh, spheres. So F and G intersect transversely and positively in a single point. Um, again, you could see this as a, as a pi zero of a sum space. And then you can show the following. Um, Namely, uh, here on the on the right hand side, I have that set, but on the left, I have um, disks embedded in N minus a tubular neighborhood of G. So if you think about this, uh, tubular neighborhood of, of G, when you take out uh, G, that's uh, just uh, S2 cross uh, D2, and then on the boundary, you have like S2 cross S1. Uh, and you can take one of these S1s, so namely the boundary of your meridian disk, to be your boundary condition, right? So that's my, my little s. Um, okay, so what, what is this map? Well, if I give you a disk, which is embedded in the, you know, the, this meridian with boundary meridian circle of G, and it's embedded in the complement of, of tubular neighborhood G, I can then just glue in this meridian disk and get a sphere. Which, has a, which was this uh, sphere that I started with. Uh, and then I observed that on the left here, I, I still have duals, right? Because S1 cross S2, namely the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of G, it's, it's, uh, it has many you know, copies of G, like push-offs of G. So S again has a, a dual, okay? So this is how you go from the setting of spheres with duals to disks with duals. You just take out the tubular neighborhood of, of G. But what is interesting is that, um, and then you can show that this is this is a bijection. Um, it just takes yeah a bit of uh, argument, um, and then you can also uh, observe that uh, conversely, if you had a four manifold, and you start studied you know uh, two disks in a four manifold, but uh, so that your boundary conditions S and G were exactly in that S1 cross S2 uh, uh, 
uh, setting. So you have a, a four manifold M, it has boundary which is uh, of which one component is S1 cross S2. Then you can glue in back this D2 cross S2, right? And, and get a, another manifold which you can call N. So that means that um, this setting with spheres is really a special case of the setting of disks when your, uh, your, your M, your S and G uh, lie in, in, you know, as S1 cross point and point cross S2 in, in, this, uh, in this component of M or the boundary of M. Okay. And that's very uh, interesting. Um, you know, then you can say, okay, the theorems that uh, of Gabay, Schneider, and Teichner uh, really, you know, classify disks uh, in that case, right? If the boundary of M is of the, that shape, you use this uh, bijection and you're done, right? So if you know, know about that work, then you know that Friedman Quinn invariant classifies. Or you know that, for example, if pi one is uh, of the manifold is trivial, um, you know that there is a unique isotopic class of disks. Uh, so here is how we, we reprove the, the statement for spheres. Namely, in that case um, that I just mentioned, um, uh, you, you can, in this subgroup uh, that I didn't really explain, but that appeared, you know, uh, in, in my, my kernel was a quotient of the, maybe I should go back and show you. Uh, so here I have a quotient of this, uh, you know, invariance of the involution uh, by something that, uh, that depends on pi three of my manifold, namely that this little dex is basically an invariant derived from this capital dex and goes from pi three of M to this uh, group ring. So I quotient out by its image. Yeah, sorry that I didn't explain this earlier. Um, then in this case, when, when your, your, your four manifold is really coming from the setting of you know, spheres where you took out the sphere, uh, then you can prove that these elements are always in the image of the little dex. Um, so that means that, uh, that your invariant dex uh, becomes uh, uh, a map like this. I mean, it, it, the, it, it reduces to such a map. And this should uh, maybe be familiar to you. That's exactly this mu3 walls invariant that I mentioned. So somehow it's, uh, it's this uh, self-intersection invariant for three spheres. Uh, you have a three sphere in N, you can then uh, uh, make, make sense of uh, an invariant uh, uh, in N cross the interval squared. So you want to make a three sphere in a six manifold in order to count its double points. Um, and then you, the indeterminacy becomes R plus R bar because now you're in an odd, dim odd dimension, I mean, three and six. And for mu two, you had like R minus R bar. So that's, that's the, really where this comes from. So this was studied in the, in the work of, of um, Rob and Peter. Um, they used uh, mu three and the closely related invariant, which are called Friedman Quinn. FQ to classify uh, isotopic classes of spheres, namely the set of spheres uh, homotopic to a given sphere, dual to G, is given by this set. They describe it as this set of, you know, you take the field with two elements, you have TN denotes uh, two torsion in your fundamental group of N. So these are just, you know, the, uh, this uh, vector space spanned span by two torsion. And then you, you mod out by the image of mu three. So this was the set that classified spheres, but you can see how we get it. We get it because now, you know, when we take um, this group ring modulo of the image of dex, well, we are just taking, you know, modulo this, we show that this is in the image and modulo image of this map, which is just mu three, okay? So this, this is this uh, bijection, okay? So we get this corollary from that proposition on the last page, namely we turn spheres into disks, okay? And then here, uh, we just need to compute um, the isotopic classes uh, in a given homotopy class, right? So that was this J, J, J inverse of K or J inverse of F. Um, and so 
because of that of this theorem where we're saying what the image of little dex is uh we say it's it's uh it's uh, the same um uh, we say we say we get that um j inverse of f is given by this group and that this group turns out to be equivalent to to the friedman queen group and actually this theorem where we when we show that little uh the x is the same as mu3 that theorem also shows somehow by definition that capital dex is the same as you know you could call this capital mu3 that's what friedman queen invariant is um so we completely like recover their 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 statement so there is no contradiction um okay any questions about that Well, there was a question long ago. Um, Sarka, do you still have a question or? No, it was it was long ago. I just uh, lost track of the, like the green disk was not part of the notation and I was confused momentarily, so. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, for, for two disks, this S, uh, is the boundary of the two disk, namely a circle embedded in the boundary of the four manifold, and that has a dual. So it's really the dual is also in the boundary. Um, okay. Yeah, I can I can go later again through that. Okay. Um, yeah, something I um, I'm not gonna. I said I'm not gonna talk about is that. Uh, those are two invariants and uh, one can really prove some properties of them so uh, understand better what uh, the group in general is so now here i'm i'm uh, i'm talking about some other results so not necessarily about spheres uh, so namely you can uh, use those properties so for example show that um, any finitely generated abelian group will appear for some four manifold uh, as, as you know, this a set of uh, actually the group of uh, isotopic classes of disks which are homotopic to K. So this notation means, you know, I fixed uh, an embedded disk K in, in M with boundary S, and I'm looking at all disks that are homotopic to it. Well, that's given by this group, and you can, um, you can realize many groups. Uh, okay, so the last slide will be about uh, that interesting point that, you know, we just saw that uh, the set of this, which are isotopic to K is actually a group, right? Um, so you can wonder what, you know, what is, what is going on? What is this group and what, you know, how, that, how to interpret it in terms of disks? Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, right, so um, that's something that I actually didn't discuss, I, I should have, but um, throughout the discussion, you somehow want to assume that you have an embedded disk, okay, because otherwise, uh, you know, this set could be empty. So I want to assume that there is, a, a, an, but it can be, you know, any disk U, I can uh, pick it as an arbitrary base point. Okay, I just call it U because I, I, in my head, think about it as an unknotted disk, but it's just any, any disk. Um, if you choose uh, such a base point, then this set becomes a group. Uh, so here I, I'm really talking about the whole set of uh, isotopic classes of disk. Um, and then uh, you can wonder what is this group? Uh, so it's this the group structure uh, uh, is such that u is your unit um and then you can uh, wonder oh okay wh whether this group is abelian for example so you can study the commutator of two elements you you take two disks uh, not necessarily homotopic or anything you just take two disks and uh study you know k1 times k2 times k1 inverse k2 inverse uh in this in this group 
uh, and we compute that uh, that disk, the resulting disk is given by doing uh, our action. Remember that uh, geometric action using finger moves and uh, Norman tricks on you. Okay, because that's that's your base point. So here, uh, the element, the group element, you want to do the uh, um, the you know your action, your finger moves along, uh, is given in terms of that equivariant intersection form. Uh, so remember, lambda was my notation for the intersection form in the in the four manifold, and uh, apply to spheres, right? To pi two elements. So to uh, to get a sphere, I take my disk k one and blew it to minus u. Okay, so that's one sphere, and here is another sphere, and I'm looking at the equivariant intersection of the those two spheres, and I'm mod out by elements one. Uh, that's uh, those are not uh, th those should not be included. Namely, if I have like a group uh, intersection which which has a group element one, I just discard that. Okay, and so to remind to remind you, this means that I take my disk U and I do finger moves along for each of the you know lambda is some uh, linear combination of group elements with signs. I do finger uh, finger moves. Um, along those group elements, and then I do that tubing into the dual. Um, and the result is this commutator. Okay. And moreover, uh, that sequence that we had uh, of in theorem A becomes an exact sequence of groups. Um, so let me first remind you what it was. Right, so we had this uh, sequence. Uh, here it was a sequence of sets. But now it actually becomes sequence of groups, where here the first and the last term where they're obviously groups, so they have their group structures. And you could wonder, well, what is this uh, uh, set and how it's related to pi two of m? Okay, so this is the set of disks rel boundary, but the boundary is really a fixed uh, circle in the boundary of m. So it turns out that this set is in bijection with pi two of m. Right, because you can just, you know, you, you're fixed on the boundary. And so that uh, could uh, then, uh, you, you could wonder, oh, should I put the, you know, usual group structure of pi two of M here? Um, and that's not the case. So you're not gonna put the usual uh, group structure that you might come up with. For this to be an exact sequence, you're gonna use another one. So that's, uh, uh, what I wanted to uh, say last. Uh, right. So here, um, um, right. So this becomes an exact sequence of groups. Uh, once you uh, put a group structure on this, which under this bijection, as I said, to pi two, you can just glue your base point disk U to get sphere. And uh, you know you can wonder, okay, but what is the corresponding group structure on the pi two of m? Um, and it will turn out that it's a non-standard group structure, which is not even abelian. Namely, you multiply two spheres by using their sum. You know, as usual in pi two, you just uh, uh, have the sum of the of the uh, of the spheres, but the you have to uh, to um, subtract a multiple of your of your dual namely g is also a sphere in m also an element of pi 2 uh, and um, and everything you know has their whiskers and uh, so don't worry about that but uh, the multiple you take out is this um, uh, you, you take the equivariant intersection of a1 and a2 okay so this is some group element um, uh, so, sorry, that's that's an element of the um, group ring, but you know that pi one acts on pi two. So by changing, you know, the whiskers. So that's how you uh, get, uh, that's the meaning of this. It's the usual action on pi two. Um, yeah, so, so one thing is that uh, in that previous uh, theorem, uh, theorem A, 
Um, I, I was just talking about how you're doing the action to get disks which are actually homotopic. So uh, you might be confused at this point, but uh, when I do this action, I'm not going to get something homotopic to you. And the reason is that here I'm not using the you know sigma invariance, the invariance of the involution. I'm taking any you know I, my my lambda lands in any elements, uh, but I can still do the same action. There, there was there you know that was not a restriction for for defining the you know the finger moves and uh, the Norman trick. So um, if I have an element here, I can still do the action. Okay, and then it's not homotopic to you anymore. But actually, it's homotopic to the following uh, disk. You connect some uh, U with this uh, element, you know, with this multiple of G, namely, um, sorry for this awkward notation, but you take this uh, element lambda tilde and uh, you take its bar minus itself. Uh, so that's, that's the homotopy class of that disk. And this, yeah, I mean, there is another theorem in the paper where we formulated this a bit better. I, I hope it's not too confusing. Uh, but uh, okay, final observation is that uh, this um, set of disks is almost never abelian. Okay, uh, namely, you know, we want this commutator to be the unit, the uh, trivial, um, and you know that will somehow happen just somehow if if this was in the kernel of that. Um, uh, thing that you know that you have to mod out by, you know the the dex invariant, the little dex invariant, um, and um, but you know that lands in somehow in the symmetric elements, uh, and you know lambda is really symmetric. Uh, it's you know Hermitian usually. It's 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 really it's, that's gonna be really symmetric. Um, so that's uh, not going to be uh, abelian. One case, for example, is if if pi one is trivial, then of course uh, you know everything somehow gets um, uh, trivial. But uh, you could also think about. Uh, let me go back. Just the final thing I want to say. Uh, you can think of the case where this is trivial, right? Pi two of m is trivial, and then uh, you would get. Uh, just a, you know, your group structure would just be abelian because it's just this group, okay? So that's uh, just one case. Um, your set would be just given by those uh, finger moves. So elements like this. And then you can see why this is abelian and that's because you can somehow do finger moves separately on two different uh, positions and uh, tube into G, okay? So if you carefully tube into G, not to, you know, to get an embedded thing, uh, the sum of two uh, elements, like for G1 and for G2, uh, it's going to be an under element and it clearly commutes. Okay, so I think uh, that's everything I have. Yeah, thanks. Are there any questions or comments for Danica? Right. If not, let's, let's oh, wait, thank wait, her wait, once I, again. Wait, wait, wait. I have a question. I was just I was just pausing not to be on this. Um, I uh, so this is sort of the same question I asked Dave goodbye after his talk, but um, can any of this help you understand pi one of disks, or let's say pi one of the embedding space of disk for the dual rather than pi zero? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if your disks have a dual on the boundary, um, I'm not sure if that's the setting you want, but yeah, that let's just, I mean, just, yeah, I, I really me, want pi one of yeah. any embedding space of yeah, two, I mean, two then, and four dimensions, but, um, uh, then this theorem, uh, tells you, uh, that pi one of this space is pi two of the space of arcs and to compute pi two of the space of arcs, as we saw, uh, that, you know, Dave and, and Ryan were doing. Uh, that basically, okay, so, so the perspective I would have is that uh, if you want to compute pi one of the, of the space of arcs in the four manifold, you have to go to the second stage of the tower. That corresponds to Hefliger-Dax work. 
if you want to compute pi two, you have to go to the third stage, okay? And then, um, you, you know, so embedding calculus gives you an invariant. Now it's a question how computable that invariant is, okay? Uh, and I would, I would say that uh, it's not too bad, okay? So it's maybe not so, uh, yet we don't know such a nice uh, uh, explicit um, description of that invariant as the DAX is giving you. So really the DAX invariant is the second invariant uh, in, the, in the tower. Okay, so the tower goes like you have T1, T2. So these are, so for people who don't know, so these are some spaces. So the DAX invariant is really invariant from going from uh, pi one of the space of embeddings to pi one of T2. And embedding calculus gives you all the other invariants. It just, you, you, don't, you can't compute them so easily as, and nicely as, you know, DAX and, and uh, Gabai uh, showed us how to compute the, the second one. But you know, there's there's things to calculate and uh, work on. So I'm optimistic. Okay, so pi. Okay, so it's not out of reach. Pi one. And yeah, it's not out of reach. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. And I mean, we can see also for you know Ryan and Dave really computed pi two of the space of arcs in a certain case. Um, that's they they use that to study. Uh, some other questions. Well, yeah. So maybe maybe the harder thing is to upgrade to saying something about pi one of two spheres with a dual, because that that part oh, yeah. going so actually, from this to spheres. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's something I didn't we didn't in the end put into the paper because we we kind of had some level uh, little issues that we didn't bother to resolve. But I think it's it's true that this proposition that I had on level on pi zero. Uh, sorry, let me find it. You know, when I explained how to go from spheres to disks, I had this proposition. Uh, and this is on pi zero, right? But in general, I could consider this space of spheres. So it's a special space. It's not the space of all spheres. Uh, it's a space of spheres which intersect the given sphere G in one point transversely. And I claim that uh, that uh, space uh, uh, fits into some vibration sequence <clears throat> where on one hand you would have uh, just disks embedded in uh, like this space, you know, disks in the manifold obtained by removing tubular neighborhood G. And then something that's like probably some kind of a Stiefel bundle of like two, but basically down, for, boils down to the, the figuring out which exactly the, the, what the derivative your, your sphere has. Uh, at you know when it intersects G and so on, so okay. there is a, so, some some, okay. some yeah there is something. So, you can do. so what I would really care about is still probably too hard, which is all spheres. Like let's say two spheres in S two cross S two, with the base point being the standard one intersects you know the dual yeah. one, but then in the intermediate stages not requiring the exactly. standard. Exactly. That's bad, right? Yes, but I would suggest that uh, one could study the then. So you, it's like. I want to, you know, advertise these vibration sequences because that's what uh, they, they're like. They're uh, encompassing all the all those differences. So, I'm talking now about the difference between this and this space. It fits into some vibration sequence, but then this space compared to one without G, uh, you could study that difference. You could study like what is the difference between those that do and do not. Uh, I think it it might be a useful point of view. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, let me know if you want to go, me to go to some previous slide because I was probably too fast. All right, if there aren't any for now, let's thank Denitza again. Um, this room will stay open, we'll take a break. We'll meet again in two hours. We'll meet again at 1 p.m. Eastern time for our next talk from Bob Gump, our next and our last talk. Thank you. We're waiting for the recording.